The Renaissance in Italy was a time of great intellectual and artistic achievements in literature and music, architecture, painting, and sculpture. But it was also a time of constant warfare, of violence and treachery, with Italy divided into small city-states, forever fighting foreign invaders and each other. A shrewd observer of this scene, and perhaps the most controversial political commentator of all time, was Niccolo Machiavelli. Many people have considered Machiavelli's political ideas immoral, inciting rulers to acts of violence and treachery. But others see him as a realist, scientifically describing, for the first time, how men really acquire and hold power. What was the nature of Machiavelli's ideas? Ideas which exert a powerful influence down to our own time. Your name? You know my name. Your name? Niccolo Machiavelli. Profession? Currently unemployed. Profession? Fourteen years, Chief Secretary to the Second Chancery here in Florence. Are you acquainted with the man Pietro Buscoli? I've told you I've met him. Or the man Agostino Caponi? No. That will be all. Name? Your name? Yeah. Machiavelli. Profession? Secretary to... Duties? Diplomatic missions to all major Italian city-states, also to courts outside Italy. Do you know the man Pietro Buscoli? Slightly. The man Capone? No. Or the man Valori or Fulci? I've met them. That will be all. Of what am I accused? Do you know the man Buscoli? Yes. Capone? No. Valori? Yes. Fulci? No. Did you conspire with these men? No. Were you aware of the conspiracy between them? What kind of conspiracy? You will come with us. Do you understand this device? Yes. Hoist him. You will now confess to being part of a plot to assassinate our lawful rulers, the Medicis. No. You served the Republic, the enemies of the Medici, for 14 years until the Republic was overthrown. I have not plotted. Drop him. Oh. I have shackles on my arms and six drops of the strapado on my back. The walls are full of lice, so big, they seem like butterflies. And there never was such a stench as in this fine dwelling of mine. Messer Machiavelli, a member of our illustrious ruling family, the Medicis, now reigns as Christ's vicar in Rome. The new pope has made it known that he wants a general amnesty declared. You are to be released without fine or taint. I congratulate you on your fortitude, and I would like to say at this time that I am personally delighted. May I suggest that your recuperation be done at your villa outside Florence? Vittori. Since my misfortune, I've led a quiet country life. I rise with the sun and go into the woods to inspect yesterday's work. Then I go to the spring with a book. Dante, Petrarch, or a minor poet. I eat lunch with my family.
Then go to the inn where I play creaker or trick track with the butcher or miller or brickmakers. At nightfall, I return home and enter my study. I remove my dirty, rustic clothes and put on noble dress. Suitably attired, I enter the courts of great men of old and hold conversations with them on the reasons for their actions. For hours, I feel no weariness, remember no trouble, no longer fear poverty or dread death. I've recorded what I've learned in a small book called The Prince. This book I have dedicated to the esteemed ruler of Florence, His Highness Lorenzo de' Medici. You are to come with me, now. His Highness, Lorenzo de' Medici. You may be seated, Machiavelli. You wrote your book, The Prince, hoping to gain employment with me in Florence. Such was my wish, Excellency. Yet you served my family's enemies loyally for 14 years. I'm ready to serve my city loyally again. Have you heard of my reactions to the book? Rumors. Which were? That the language in the book was not grandiloquent enough. That you prefer your hunting dogs to my thoughts. This was the word I spread. As a matter of fact, I am deeply disturbed by the book. So disturbed that I've summoned you here in secret. In secret, Machiavelli. Your ideas fly in the face of all I've been taught about governing. Perhaps you've been taught incorrectly. Where is the truth? There are those who, who want me to believe that men are basically good. And the effect of Prince is noblest of all. But your book describes a savage world in which only cynical and treacherous rulers flourish. Now, these thoughts of yours must be put to the test. You are to be debated by the philosopher and humanist, Count Francesco Scali, my tutor and well-known expert on governments both ancient and modern, Giovanni Bossoni, and the noted theologian and scholar, Alberigo de Musso. I must choose what sort of prince I am to be. If my ideas prevail? I could become Machiavellian. I could employ you. I could suppress your writing. I could suppress you. As you defend yourself, quote directly from your works if you wish. Machiavelli, what about the goodness of princes? A prince should not deviate from doing good if that is possible. But he should be ready to do evil if that is necessary. Let me quote from other thinkers. Xenophon. By his own virtues, the good prince is an example to all. Aristotle. A prince should be chosen for leadership because of goodness. Polybius. A man becomes a prince only after the principles of justice and goodness are added to might and power. Plutarch, justice is the measure of royal greatness. Pleasing texts, but do they have anything to do with the world? Perhaps these great men imagine things that have never been. Whereas you possess the truth. I have tried to present things as they are, not as we want them to be. It is my experience that he who forgets what is for what should be is quickly ruined. Our great contemporary Erasmus states that the qualities necessary for a good ruler are wisdom, integrity, clemency, 
self-restraint, and an interest in truth and liberty. I say a prince must appear to have these qualities. Above all, he must seem to be religious. He must fear God. Neither God nor the devil has brought Italy to the edge of ruin. It is our own political and military weakness. And neither God nor the devil will save us. You patterned your prince after the prince Cesare Borgia. Let's consider a specific act of Borgia's. Let's consider the siege of Faenza. The city held out bravely against the terrible Borgia Duke, but inevitably it fell. The beloved ruler of Faenza, the young Astori Manfredi, went to Borgia's battle tent and begged for mercy. I grew up well, not for himself, I but for his city. Every inch of this city. Please do not destroy Faenza. Enough. Rise. I should kneel to you. Such valor has scarcely ever been seen in one so young. My city? There will be no retaliation. No new taxes. The city's laws will stand. How will I know? That I will keep my word. You're free to leave. To leave? But if you choose to stay, as my lieutenant, my strongest sword, you will observe in what high regard I hold your city and you. I expected to die today. Preserve Faenza, and I will be yours to the death. To the death. On Tuesday. The next day, a story Manfredi appeared at the side of Cesare Borgia before the astonished and then wildly cheering inhabitants of Faenza. A few weeks later, he was thrown into a dungeon in the Castle San Angelo in Rome. And sometime after this, a body thought to be his was found floating in the Tiber. But it was so badly decomposed, identification was difficult. There are those who consider this an act of treachery. Borgia kept his word. The city was not destroyed. Only the prince was destroyed. As story Manfredi was loved by his people. As long as he lived, he was a threat to the Borgias. Borgia spared rulers who were hated. That's mercy. Consider this. The people of Faenza were accustomed to being ruled by princes. Deprive them of their prince, and unable to rule themselves, they must turn to and depend on a new prince. In this case, Borgia. For this kind of logic, a promising life was destroyed. Borgia used cruelty properly. He inflicted the injuries he had to inflict all at once. Loqua. When the city falls, you will see to it that some of your men loot. That will be no problem. They're always ready. After the looting becomes established, other men of yours will arrest the looters. They will be hanged in a conspicuous place. Make certain the people know I gave the order. I don't understand. You will have gotten rid of a few troublemakers, and people will see that I stand for the law. What if citizens are killed by the looters? And those who survive will be doubly grateful. Lorqua, when this campaign is over, you will govern the conquered cities of the Romagna. And you will be fair, but harsh. But I am not popular. You will be even less so. Better you than me. The Romagna had been full of petty, feuding tyrants. By making an example or two, Borgia restored order. The words an example or two refer to human beings. Which is worse in a ruler, a little selective cruelty or a misplaced sense of humanity which permits destructive disorders to arise? Borgia was feared, not hated. He brought order, which men prize more than liberty. He was respected because he was a success. I have been taught that it is better to rule through love than through fear. Love is a bond men break when it is to their advantage to do so. Fear of punishment makes men behave. Christianity teaches a different ethic. Christianity. Christianity requires that men look to the next world rather than this one. It makes men gentle and humble, ready to submit to anything for the sake of going to paradise. This is fine for the masses. 
but lethal for the prince. The virtues you scorn are man's hope for peace. Peace? A profane word. A prince must concentrate on war, its organization and discipline. There is no comparison between a man who is armed and one who is not. Even the unarmed prophet fails. In peace, even more than in war, the prince must not let his thoughts stray from the study and exercise of battle. War or the prospect of war prevents boredom, channels ambition, makes men turn to the leader. Wars can be lost. There's no such thing as a safe course of action. A prince is always choosing between risks. Well, the risk is really taken by the people. For they're the ones who die for the glory of the prince. People like you, Machiavelli, and your wife and children. What can I say? War is with us. It is a fact. Wars cannot be avoided. They can only be deferred to the advantage of others. You worship the prince and the state. When the state becomes all, and the prince becomes a god, what restraints are left? What of a prince's obligation to his subjects, to humanity, to God? He feels none, because he has made himself the center of existence. He is ready to subordinate all life to his will. He has become the earth shaker, the tyrant, ready to murder millions to achieve his ends. The Bible says, woe unto thee that spoilest, and dealest treacherously. For when thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. Between the prince and the beast is the width of a sheet of paper. That's as it should be. But the prince lives in a world of men and laws. Which he must understand and use. But he must also use the legacy of the beast, force. Since the prince must be able to act like a beast, he must learn from the beast, from, say, the fox and the lion. The lion can be caught by traps, the fox by wolves. Therefore, he must be a fox to avoid traps and a lion to avoid wolves. Like Borgia? Yes, like Borgia, when his captains revolted against him. John Paolo Boglioni, Vitelli Vitelloso. The list of those who rebelled was long and impressive. Oliveto de Fermi, Guido Baldo, Metaforio. Excellency, I have just received word that the fortress of San Leo has been taken. Also, there is a rumor that Moncada has fallen. We are surrounded. What are your orders? Your orders, Highness. No orders, Agapito. Watch your head! Agapito! No orders. Excellency, two men have arrived. They seem to be unaware of each other's presence. One is a courier, supposedly from the French king, but he speaks uh, miserable French. And I'm told he bears a certain resemblance to the rebel Paolo Orsini. The other is dressed as a monk. He is thought to be the traitor Baglioni. Their ranks are breaking. Make certain the two are kept separated. The rebels do not trust me, but they trust each other less. Tell each of them that I personally guarantee to defend their possessions. In turn, they must pledge themselves to defend mine. All of mine. Excellency, the town of Senegalia has been taken for you by Olivolotto da Fermi. Fermi has sent word that the Citadel, under the captain Andrea Doria, still holds out. Doria will surrender to no one but you, personally. A oh, child could see through this trick. Doria is in league with them. They fear you to such a degree that their only hope is to lure you into a trap and kill you. Lorqua. Send word to Oliverotto that I will be there to take the key to the castle, providing that all my captains are there also, including those who recently disagreed with me. Inform him that I am sending my French lances back to France, and that now that I have everyone's loyalty again, I will disperse my troops and come with only a few men. At once, my lord. With only a small escort, the Duke then journeyed to Senegalia. Two miles from the city, he met and embraced the conspirators, and they all entered the city, going to the Palazzo Bernardino. Cesare Borgia, Oliverotto da Fermi, Vitellozzo, 
the Duke of Gandia, and Paolo Orsini. Gentlemen, we have much to discuss, but first I must attend to some business elsewhere. I will be back in a few moments. You are mistaken. You have no business to attend unless we give permission for you to do so. You are mistaken. As we entered the city, so did my troops. There is more than one road to Senegalia. Oliver Roto, I would have thought that after campaigning with me, you would know enough to watch all possible routes. This is bluff. My army was until a short time ago in my employ. Being prudent men, they have chosen to return to my service. <laughs> Gentlemen, I must be gone. Nicolotto here will make my wishes known. Cesare! <laughs> Pains have we gone on together? I have a wife, children, Chaser. The Duke then wrote a letter informing Italy that after the disbanding of his French troops, the conspirators thought him helpless and were about to attack him. So, in self defense and with the utmost reluctance, he was forced to attack them first. Providing an excuse was hardly necessary, for nearly everyone applauded the beautiful trick, as it was called. Borgia acted perfectly. He waited when it was wise to wait, and moved swiftly when decision was needed. He assumed men are bad, and their viciousness will be revealed at the right moment. To preserve power, this is an assumption a prince must make. Mankind survives despite the fraud and deceit of the few, not because of it. True, there are differences and clashes between men. But more important, there are common interests. In every phase of life, in, in the family, in business, in the relationship of rule to ruler and prince to prince, there is, there has to be, basically trust. Out of cooperation, not trickery. Men have built civilizations. Noble sentiments to one side. From my experience, those who have known how to trick men with their cunning have held power. When those who have kept their word have fallen. Then what of Borgia's failure? When everyone discovers that a man practices only deceit, what further good are his lies? He failed because of the extraordinary malice of fortune. When the Borgia Pope died, Cesare Borgia was also deathly ill. He provided for every emergency except his own sickness. He failed because no one trusted him. At his moment of weakness, all men turned against him for good reason and cast him down. Imprisoned, despised, exiled to Spain, he finally perished in an obscure and pointless little war. He charged the enemy. His own troops failed to follow him, so he was cut off, trapped, alone. <laughs> blood he spilled. What was gained? Given more time, he would have unified Italy. You magnify his importance. He was no more than another rubber baron. He was a man in whom some spark seemed to show. He had only five years from the time he first drew his sword. Now who will liberate Italy? Who will end the pillaging of Lombardy and the extortion of the Kingdom of Naples and Tuscany? If a people must be cast down, for a great leader to arise, then surely it is our time. For we're enslaved and leaderless, crushed, despoiled, overrun. Machiavelli! What if I turn out to be a reformer, willing to try new forms of government to improve people's lot? You will fail. Men have no faith in things they have never experienced. Well, then you only allow me to rule in your mold. One government must dominate. Until then, we are all animals. Whatever principles our states may profess, their practice will be that of the jungle. By using your methods, I would cure the patient by poisoning him. You will use my methods, whether you admit it or not. If not to gain power, then to hold it. Something has happened to you, Machiavelli. To your mind. Perhaps during your arrest. I have presented the world as it is. A distorted world. You think so because it conflicts with the world you carry in your head. 
I wonder what your book will do to the minds of those who dream of absolute power. No matter what I say, you people will consider that I have lost our debate. If I were sufficiently Machiavellian, would I admit you won it? At least employ me. I waste away in inactivity. Use me, Excellency. Perhaps, but in nothing significant. Escort him back now. Machiavelli, you are still alive. Take solace in that. A decade later, the Medici government in Florence was overthrown and the Republic re-established. Machiavelli sought to gain back his job as secretary to the Second Chancery. I am sorry to have to inform you, Messer Machiavelli, that Francesco Taruggi has been appointed to the position instead of you. Taruggi is a mediocrity. I'm not in a position to question the Republic's choice. You people hate and fear me because I reveal the secrets of your power. I expose your politics and yourselves for what you are. That will be enough. I hold up a mirror and show you the real image of yourselves. The image of power politics, of selfish interests, of politicians who lie and cheat and deceive the people. You! You expect an appointment, yet after the fall of the First Republic, you did everything you could to get work with the Medicis. You wooed them, you groveled before them, you dedicated books to them. And you expect us to trust you? At least, give me something to do. Go back and scratch on your papers. With us, you are through. Ten days later, Niccolo Machiavelli was dead. You will use my methods, whether you admit it or not. If not to gain power, then to hold it. Do you believe Machiavelli's analysis of political reality is valid? Must politicians adopt Machiavellian principles in order to succeed? What relevance do you think Machiavelli's ideas have for us today?